All right, welcome back everyone. <clears throat> this is going to be lecture uh, 19 about underactivated robotics. There's a little bit of a deviation from the, the previous content and definitely from the material from previous years. But I think that a lot of robots out there, uh, especially mobile robots, are underactivated in some sense. So it's definitely not, this is definitely a topic that's, supposed, uh, that's worth talking about. Um, so for today, I have a few announcements, but the topic is going to be, I really want to talk about the manipulated lipsoids. This is a topic that was supposed to be, I thought it would be a little more straightforward, but I guess it generated a lot of confusion. So some of your classmates requested that I would go over it. So I'm going to do that um, one last time. So I'm going to talk about the manipulated lipsoid, the forced lipsoid, and the, all the test space inertia, which is also represented using an ellipsoid. Uh, next, I want to talk about today's video, which is a really cool one. Uh, then I want to talk about linear approximation for the equation of motion and fixed points um, and equilibrium. And also, I guess I forgot to mention, I want to define what underactuated robotics, excuse me, underactuated robots are. Okay, so some announcements. File, uh, milestones uh, number three was due today. Um, I think all the teams uh, submitted all, uh, their reports. Um, one team submitted that three minutes before it was due. <laughs> I guess one of you, some of you guys like to live on the edge. Um, something that got me a little bit concerned was that there was a total of 32 and 14 total views for uh, each of the last two lecture videos, respectively. And um, the thing is, I don't want you guys to let the content accumulate so don't wait to watch the videos and then to take your notes and do all that stuff do it right away because if you let it accumulate it's gonna you know accumulate with the next milestones and all the work to have for the next classes so really make sure you're you're using your time well during the this time you're staying at home okay um, milestone four will be released later today um, I'm going to release a video talking about it as well, so hopefully it's going to be um, as clear as I can as I can make it using online tools. Okay, so first let me talk about uh, the lipsoids. The first one, which is the first one that we saw, is the manipulability lipsoid, and this is it. The only thing that it does is that it it indicates the robot's ability to generate motion in a particular direction, right? So in order to do that, oh, there's a dot missing right here. In order to do that, we use the Jacobian. So the, the, the goal of the Jacobian is mapping how does the joint velocities map to the end of factor velocities, right? And what that is doing is just indicating how well can a manipulator move in a certain direction. So if you have a unit circle, on the joint uh, velocities, and you uh, and you go around that circle. When you multiply that with the Jacobian, that circle is going to be mapped into some sort of ellipsoid, right? So the way that you calculate it is that, for example, let's say this is starts at one. So you're going to start at that guy, which is one zero. You're going to multiply it by the Jacobian at this particular configuration, and this is going to be mapped into a point right here. And then you're going to go to the point right next to it, right next to it, and then you're going to get to this point. This is going to be j times 0, 1. This is going to be mapped to a point here on the Jacobian. And then as you go around the circle, you're just doing the projection around this ellipsoid, right? So this is what it's calculating. So what it's doing is that for a particular configuration, so for example, if you look at this figure here on the top, this particular configuration is when the manipulator the two degree freedom manipulator is at a certain angle like this. For that particular configuration, the robot uh, can move well in a certain direction or not, right? And that's and that's indicated by the the by the Jacobian. Um. So, and in in that point also, if you have configuration which you need singular singular so that means that the manipulator cannot generate a velocity in a certain direction so for example if manipulator is straight out like that both angles are uh, both linkages are parallel um, then you cannot generate motion in that direction 
right? Um, if the manipulator also is folded on itself, right? So this, this guy like here, you also cannot generate motion in that direction. So all these represent singular configurations. And on all these configurations, what happens numerically is that the det determinant of the Jacobian goes to zero. Okay, so the manipulability slide just tells you how well can the robot move in a particular direction. And the way that you calculate that is using the joint velocity. So for a unit um, joint velocity, how well does it move in a particular way? There's a pretty good read about it on page 174 of One in Robotics, so I suggest you take a look at that. Um, the second way that you can think about the manipulability ellipsoid is about um, the eigenvalues. So if you have a general case, you map the end effector coordinates to the joint coordinates using the Jacobian. So the end effector coordinates, also I forgot a dot here, the end effector coordinates here is going to be, for example, x dot, y dot, z dot, Oops. Omega X, Omega Y, Omega Z, right? And that's going to be mapped to joint velocities using the Jacobian. So what happens is that when you have your unit circle, all the points that lie on that unit circle can be written compactly in this form, right? So if you use a Jacobian, you can also do all this conversion and then get to this expression right here. So what happens is that the ellipsoids are the the ellipsoid can be described by the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix here. So let's call this, this a matrix A. So what happens is that the the eigenvalues, the eigenvectors of this matrix indicates the major axis, this the largest and smaller axis of your force ellipsoid. And the length of these axes are given by the, the square root of the eigenvalues. So if the eigenvalues are lambda, the length of the, the axes are given by square root of the lambda, and uh, they are in the direction of their eigenvectors. Right. So this is the ellipsoid for a general case. So you can think about, you can have a ellipsoid like this in 3D. So it will be uh, in uh, uh, three axes that indicate capability of generating velocity in some direction, linear velocity, and another 3D ellipsoid that will tell you how well the robot can, you know, generate angular velocity in, in different axes of rotation. Okay, so there's two ways you can, you can calculate. The first one, you know, is the one uh, is just doing this, so you can calculate what is the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the Jacobian times Jacobian transpose. Or you can do what I suggested on the next on the previous one. If you have like a unit circle and you go around that circle, that's going to be and multiply that by the Jacobian. That's going to be mapped to some sort of ellipse, right? This is easy to do in 2D, but you can see that when you get to uh, 3D or even higher dimension, then this kind of uh, calculation gets a lot harder to do. Okay, so. Manipulability slide tells you how well can the robot move in a certain direction. Okay. The force ellipsoid, on the other hand, tells you how well can the robot generate force in a particular direction, right? And the way that it is calculated is through the Jacobian, um, the Jacobian transpose. So if you have a unit velocity, angular velocity, and you multiply that by the Jacobian, that gives you the velocity of the end effector. If you, if you have a joint torque, and you multiply by the minus, uh, the transpose of minus one, that's gonna give you the force that you generate in the end effector. So that means that the um, in directions that you, um, so, okay, so, what happens is that the Jacobian, the Jacobian transpose, inverse transpose tells you how well the robot can generate force in, diff in different configurations. In the same way, if you have a singular configuration, then that means that uh, you can generate infinite force in a certain direction. So if you have a manipulator and has a straight line, we saw that it could not generate motion in this direction. Right, because the Jacobian here had um, 
the determinant of Jacobian on this configuration was zero. But on the other hand, you, you can think that if you apply a force and any factor in this configuration, the robot can resist infinite force. And the reason because and the reason for that is because it requires zero torque here and here to resist that force. Okay? So what happens is that the, the, the force ellipsoid just tells you how much force can you produce in a certain direction in the factor given a uh, unit, for example, unit or, or, or some sort of other proportional joint torque, right? And this is how you map. And the way that you do the mapping is exactly the same. So you're going to start here, it is going to be 1, 0, and then you go around, and it's going to be 0, 1. And then when you multiply that by the Jacobian, oops, I should Q. The Jacobian minus trans, inverse transpose, you're going to get some ellipsoid projection. Okay? And in this case, because it's the inverse of the Jacobian, the principal axis uh, are aligned with the eigenvectors and eigenvectors of J, trans, J times J transpose and that all inverse. There's a pretty good read about it on page 176 on modern robotics, so I suggest you check it out. Okay? So if you look, at the manipulable ellipsoid and a force ellipsoid, they should have uh, the, the the axis swapped, right? So in directions that, for example, you can generate a lot of velocity, you cannot generate as much force. And in the direction that you cannot generate a lot of velocity, you should be able to generate a ton of force, right? And, and the reason behind this is you can think about it just as a mechanical advantage, right? If you have a lever arm, um, you can map for example, um, so let's say you have a lever, right? So this, if this is displacement is x1 and this displacement is x2, right? The displacement of x1 is n times larger or smaller than the displacement of x2, right? And that's given by the ratio between these two, these two levers. Right. But you can also think that the force that is generated in F1 in that direction is n times larger than the force generated in F2. Right. So it is the same exact idea as the what the Jacobian is doing and what the manipulability ellipsoid and the force ellipsoid should behave like. Right. So so they should be perpendicular to each other. Okay. Um, again, there's a really good read about it on page 177 with Modern Robotics, so I should suggest you check it out. The last ellipsoid I want to talk about is the, the, the ellipsoid because of the task space inertia, right? And the only thing that this is doing is it indicates the apparent mass of an manipulator that is felt by an external force. So that means that if you have a manipulator like here and you, you grab its end effector and apply it forward in a certain direction, how much, how heavy does it feel? So it's the same idea if you have like a block and this block has some mass m and you apply a force f, right? So the acceleration in this case is just, just like this because this is just 1D. But what happens is that when you have this coupling effect used uh, because of the joint of the manipulator, depending on which way you apply the force on the end effector, you're going to feel as if the manipulator was lighter or heavier, right? And the way that you compute how heavy or light it feels is using the test space inertia. And that is the expression that we, we got from, um, that we saw, right? So this big lambda here is a test space inertia. That's gonna map, if you wanna generate a require, if you wanna generate some unit acceleration in some direction, that's how much force is gonna require you in order to do that. So. In this bold black one here, that's the required ac acceleration that you want to generate. And in this case, that's going to, that's going to tell you what is the required force. So we can, in this case, for example, if you think about, I want to move up. So that's going to move the second link and is going to rotate the first link, right? So FY should be large because you're going to be moving two links at the same time. If I want to move in X direction, I'm only going to rotate the second link, right? So that means that 
the moving X should feel lighter because I'm just moving one of the links. So that's the kind of the intuition behind if I want to move in a certain way, um, if you use heavier, or if I want to move in a different direction, if you use even heavier. And then when you get to a singular uh, configuration, so for example, the robot is straight up like this. If I want to apply a force here in any directions, the, the actuator is going to feel infinitely heavy, right? Because it won't be able to move. So what happens is that this ellipsoid becomes um, becomes a, a, a line when you when you get to a certain direction. So in this case, you're going to feel infinitely heavy, and in this direction, it's going to feel as if I'm moving the two joints. Okay. So these are the, the, the all the many the ellipsoids that we care. One tell you how well can a robot generate velocity or or means motion in one way. That's a manipulable ellipsoid. The other one tells you how much force can the manipulator generate in a certain direction. That's going to be your force ellipsoid. And the last one is going to be the test space inertia ellipsoid, which is going to tell you how heavy does it feel to move the manipulator in a certain direction, right? So, and the test space inertia um, ellipsoid is going to be configuration dependent, right? So in, in this other in the other case here, now the manipulator has this different configuration here with the bent elbow, and it's going to feel really heavy to move it in this direction, but it's not that bad to move it in this direction. This should be intuitive. So if this manipulator keeps folding that way um, up to the point that now, you know, it folded on itself like that, so that manipulator is going to feel infinitely heavy to move that way, right? And it's going to have not a lot of inertia to move up and down. Okay, so I hope this is clear. Um, I forgot to mention, but uh, there's a if you go here, there's a pretty good read about this part on page 282 of Modern Robotics. So to go check it out. If it's still unclear, just let me know. But this ellipsoid is supposed to tell you what is um, sort of what is the performance, the expected performance of a manipulator. How well does it generate motion? How how well does it generate force? And how heavy does it feel? Okay. All right. So I hope everything is clear by now. Um, let me know if it's not. Next thing I want to uh, so let's talk now about today's video. So today's video about this really cool. It's not one robot. It's a bunch of robots. So it's pretty funny. This YouTube channel is about this guy that makes all these crazy gymnast robots in his basement, and it's crazy how this must be so much hand tuning that goes into this. But he managed to get some really inter interesting results. So I'm going to play a little bit of the video and then I'm going to let you guys watch the rest of yourself. The reason why I'm showing this, yeah, so you must wonder how much hand tuning must go into this sort of stuff. But what I want to show on this is that everything that these robots are doing is sort of the idea behind one of the robots that I'm going to talk about today, which is Acrobot. Which is... Um, it's pretty much our planar manipulator, but now you're only able to generate uh, torque in the elbow, which is exactly this, what it's showing right now. That's the acrobat. So you can generate torque at the elbow, but you cannot generate a lot of torque on the the base, right? Which is which is the shoulder of our manipulator. Yeah. So all all these all these robots are crazy because they're all under actuated there are times that robot is allowed to generate acceleration in a certain directions and there are other times that the manipulator just needs to the the robot just can only follow its dynamics there's nothing it can do there's certain periods of time when it's, it's airborne or when it has a weird contact uh, configuration that the, the robot cannot generate acceleration in certain directions. So that's the definition of underactuated. So I'm going to stop the video here. You can go and check out the link, but it's got some some pretty cool stuff. All right. So what I want to talk about today is, is underactuated systems. And these are systems that um, um, they have some sort of limitation on what they can do. So a fully actuated system um, is a system that you can allow 
that there's at any state and instance you're you're able to generate acceleration arbitrary acceleration in any direction you want right so that's pretty much i can choose whatever q double dot i want at any time so of course it's not realistic for um all the inputs out there because everything has torque limits but uh, mathematically if the expression allows me to generate arbitrary uh, accelerations so that that defines my system as fully actuated so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today comes from the notes from the class under extra robotics from rest Tetrick. it's a really good class they have a lot of online lectures and I definitely suggest you checking it out but before we do that let's just get into the the standard format so in the past we talked about the manipulator equation that looks something like this right now i i didn't include the j transpose f but if you can think that this can be added to your input then this can be dropped out but it, it doesn't matter so what I want to show is that you can rearrange your equations to look something like this which is all used for the ODE and the general form of a nonlinear dynamic system is looks something like this expression right here so your acceleration is going to be proportion to uh, your current position your current velocity your input and also maybe some time dependence on trajectory or something that you, you that you have in your system right so this is going to be the most general form of any mechanical systems and what is nice about it is that a lot of mechanical systems and robots have some structure to it so in a lot of cases they are um, sorry I forgot here they are control affine so what that means is that you have uh, linear they linearly multiply the control input so you can always split out your equations in something that looks like this you have some function that depends on the joint angles and, and positions and, and whatnot and also you have a second function that linearly multiplies your control input and during what that's called it's um, called control affine so what we're going to do is we're going to define that an under actuated system is a system that the rank of that matrix is less than the dimension of your system so and that's going to be your uh, the column rank okay so that means if this is the case that means that um, you have uh, you cannot generate arbitrary acceleration so that f2 is going to look you know uh, skinny in this direction and long in this direction so that means that there's some combination of q double dot that i cannot generate and in this case uh, the robot is going to be under actuated there's also the case that you know if you have some sort of input constraint for example torque limits or velocity limits um the robot is going to be under actuated but um this is going to be a limitation of pretty much any system that you deal with in real life okay so if you think about our hopping leg it is under actuated system for a bunch of reasons and some of the reasons are you know the motors have torque limits so your input torque has always got to be limited by what your actuator can do uh, something else that uh, joints one and two are not actuated you know like the boom one and two joints are not actuated so your selection your torque input selection matrix is something that looks you know something like that so that means that um, there's some situations that I cannot generate uh, whatever theta the one double dot that I want or to the two double dot that I want, I gotta do that indirectly using the actuators on on the hip and the knee of the leg. Um, during flight, the robot cannot affect trajectory, right? So if the robot's it's it's uh it's hopping around, when is on its flight trajectory, there's nothing that the actuators can do that would change the ballistic motion of the of the central mass, right? So there's when the robot's airborne there's nothing i can do in order to generate some q double dot that i would like maybe so uh, and that could be in theta one or theta two um something else that happens um for example during stents the the contact is limited by friction right so if the robot is just standing here 
I can only generate forces that look something like that. I can never pull on the ground, which means generating a force down. Or I can never generate more force than friction would allow me to. <clears throat> so the contact force has some constraints to it too. So what ends up happening is that this system becomes not feedback equivalent. In a lot of cases, remember that we would write a feedback law that in the end would give you something that looks like this. So q double dot is equal to you and this you is something you could you could design to be whatever you want so it could be you know a pd it could be a pid or a bunch of cases when you have an under actuated system you cannot do this <coughs> excuse me so what's going to happen is that these systems are, are not uh feedback equivalent something an alternative to this is that sometimes you can do what we call partial feedback linearization and I'm going to talk about that in the next class, but that, what that means is that you can choose some coordinates of Q, QI to be feedback equivalent, you know, some UI, but you cannot do that for all the coordinates. Um, so that's called partial feedback linearization, and we'll talk about that later on. So when you have an undirected system, there are many types of constraints that you must deal with, and this is not going to be super relevant in this class, but it will something you need to know for next classes. So you can have some expression that uh, tells you joint limits. So in this case, for example, we have some function phi that gives us joint limits. So this could be as simple as, for example, Q1 has to be less you know, than pi over two, something like this, or it can be a combination of things. Could be something like Q1 plus Q2, it's could gotta be less than an expression, right? And depending on what kind of mechanism you you design, this, this constraint could be active. You can also have some sort of actuation limits. So for example, we saw um, you know, your U must be less than some torque max and torque minimum of your actuator, or you can even go into um, more realistic models in which you know your actuator input is going to depend on, on velocity as well. So for example, Remember on the manipulator on the rope on the motors we saw the the torque omega curve of the motor looks something like this. So that means that the faster you go, you can produce less torque. So you could model this as some sort of nonlinear function phi u as well, if you'd like. And the last kind of constraint that you can usually find in this kind of systems are some sort of contact constraints. And this is what this figure here on the right is representing. Right, so the ground reaction force that you have are maps to joint torques using Jacobin. So J transpose joint torques is equal to F, the ground reaction force. And we remember that if you have a contact constraint, you must be limited by a unilateral constraint. So that means you cannot pull on the ground. And also you gotta be limited by friction. And so this red thing you that see here, that's called your friction cone. And this slope here is proportional to one over mu, which is a friction coefficient. So your ground reaction force can only live inside this upside down triangle, right? You can never generate a force, for example, in this direction because that would require more friction than you have than you than you you're, you you have that you allow to to generate. Or you cannot generate a force that goes down because that would be pretty much that would mean that you pulling on the ground, which is something that doesn't happen. So you can have some, some sort of constraint that depends on a combination of your, your joints, positions, joint velocities, and control inputs. And those will look like this. Um, the position dependence comes here. Maybe the velocity dependence is on your tau. So for all these, because of all these constraints, there are many situations that you are not allowed to generate an arbitrary kill the ball dot in some direction. So that's going to render your system to be underactuated, right? All right. Okay. Um, there's many times of there are many types of classic underactuated systems, um, and here I, I'm just mentioning a few of them. I, I personally work in, in some pretty interesting ones, especially pendul pendulum pendulums, and um, Pretty much it's always the idea that you gotta balance something. So a pretty typical one is one that we saw in the past. That's the, the, the acrobat that you see here. So for example, in this case, you got a robot that has, oh, I don't know what happened there. You have a robot that has 
the ability to generate torque on the second link but no ability to generate torque on the first link so and in, in this simulation in this experiment here you see that the robot is able to pump energy into the system until it's upside down and then it's using the torque on the second link in order to bounce another kind of uh, actuated system and this is under actuated because you know we don't have one actuated on the first joint another kind of under actuated system for example are, are jugglers right so in this case you see a robot and what it does is actually it can bounce that ball and the reason why it's under actuated for example is because the contact between the ball and the surface is not something you can control uh, when the ball is airborne, there's nothing you can do about it. So and there's many situations that you cannot generate a desired ball acceleration in a certain direction, right? If the ball is just touching the surface, you wouldn't be able to move uh, parallel to the surface. You have to make it bounce and then go to the side, right? Uh, another type of, of system is some, this called the, the car pole. This is a very classic one. Pretty much the idea is that you can is a pendulum that has a passive joint so what you can do you can place the cart on the rail whatever you want but the pendulum itself is passive so to balance the pendulum you gotta place that cart on the bottom in a certain position so this is an actuator system because now you have two joints but you only have access to one actuator okay and the last kind of underactuator system that I thought I would mention is this really cool juggler, which is a uh, cable driven juggler. Um, and it's really cool because, as I mentioned in the past, cable driven robots can, get, ha can have a pretty low reflector inertia, so that means that you can move it really, really fast uh, if you have um, powerful actuators. So, in this case, it's demonstrating how you can have a really fast robot to just uh, juggle a ball and again it's under actuated because you cannot make that ball go in a particular direction at all times right you need to be able to you need to be clever on how you throw it and grab it and make it move in different directions okay so these are some classic uh, examples there are a bunch more walking robots under actuated for all the reasons I explained in the past flying robots uh, swimming robots so pretty much quad rotors so a lot of the systems out there are all under actuated Okay, all right. Um, oops. Okay. Um, all right. There you go. <coughs> Excuse me. So, a lot in a lot of the systems, sometimes um, what we want to do is, is look at look at the con how to control it around some sort of um, some sort of position that we interested in. So, for example, if you have uh, some sort of pendulum that you're trying to balance, usually you want to know how the dynamics looks like around uh, the equilibrium point, which is the pendulum being upright. And a lot of the tools that we developed throughout the years um, are all based in linear control theory. So it's very common approximation to linearize the dynamics of your system around some um, some intrinsic control point. So pretty much this is the idea. If you have some sort of, you know, your 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 dynamics that looks something like this so x dot is equal to some function of x and u and this is the the red curve here you can actually approximate that red curve using this blue line here uh around a desired point of interest that has um, this called x star and u star right so if you are around this point, so within this area, you can pretty much tell what's happening with the dynamics. But if you know if you deviate too much, then now your dynamics is going to be really far from what it's supposed to be. So it's usually the case that you're always going to linearize a bunch around a bunch of different points, or you're going to always try to stay within an area around the point that you're trying to linearize. Okay. Um. So usually, so the, the easiest way to do that is to use a, a first order Taylor expansion. So if this is your, your original uh, expression that you care, and here we define X as, for example, your, your angles and angles dots, uh, you can approximate the equation motion in a first order Taylor expansion. So the way that that happens is that the first component is just evaluation of the the function at that point so if you look here on the plot that'll be exactly that point right there and if you move 
a little bit away from it, which is defined by this sort of motion here. The way that you vary is, is given by your partial derivatives. So if you move in the x direction, the, the amount that you increase proportional to the partial derivative of your uh, function f in respect to x uh, in applied to your, your uh, linearization point. And then if you have a little deviation on the u direction, that's going to vary proportional to the partial derivative of f, f in respect to u, right? And when you have many degrees of freedom, these partial derivatives all look like matrices. And the matrices, they look like something like that. So it's going to be, and, you know, f is going to be a vector, a vector of expressions. So when you evaluate the partial derivatives, you're going to derive a matrix. So the first component is going to be partial f, first component f1, x1. So what's going to happen is that you have x1, x2, ta, 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 is equal to f1, x, u, f2, x, u, and all these. So your partial f, partial x is going to be f1, x1, and then there's going to be all the components f1, x, 2n. Uh, I mean, n because n right now is the dimension of q, right? So you have you're going to have 2n um, states, and so and f2 is going to go in this direction until you get partial f2 and partial x1 up to the point that you have partial f2n, x2n, right? And all evaluated at x. This is going to be multiplying by how much you're deviating. And then you have exactly the same idea on fu. The only difference now is that you have only uh, n inputs, not 2n. So this guy is going to go all the way to 2n. OK? OK. All right. So in the case that you have, uh, when we have our, our, you know, manipulator that we love here, um, the equation of motion is going to be written in this form that we all know right now. And if you write down your your f, your f is going to be something like that. So the the top component. So this is going to be x x double dot is equal to x dot, which is in this case just x dot itself and then the bottom is going to be the equation of motion so what we can do is that we can approximate this function f around the linearization point that we care about and this linearization point is going to be x star and u star so um what you get is that you have two linear matrices one of them is going to be what i'm going to call a lim from linear and the second one is going to be b linear so if you replace this expression with, with the air with x bar and this expression with u bar, what you get is this, right? So you move this thing there. So this is going to be x minus x star. So this is equivalent to u bar x. And then you get this expression here. So what is important to realize is that you're going to get a different a and B matrix, which, which means a different approximation to the function at every linearization point. So if the robot is at this configuration, you're going to get uh, one A and B matrix. If the robot is at this configuration, there's going to be a different one. It's going to be a different one if you get it here. So pretty much any configuration that you linearize your system around, you're going to have different uh, linear approximations to it. Okay. So that pretty much the same idea if you have, you know, an f function, this is x, your f has very weird dynamics. Depending on where you're linearizing, you're going to have different approximations to what that f should look like. Okay? And the reason why we're approximating a very complicated function as something linear, which is simpler, is because of a lot of the tools that we develop over the year work really well for linear systems, but they don't. But they tend to be a lot harder from, for for um, nonlinear systems. Okay. So 
what is nice is that when you linearize a point, there's a fixed point, and that mean a fixed point means that your x dot is equal to zero. The expression uh, tends to be uh, tends to be a lot a lot easier. So if, if you have if we have our manipulator dynamics, so x double dot plus cq dot plus g equal to u, and we linearize around a point x star and u star which that if I evaluate its function, it's equal to zero. That's called fixed point. And the expression for your A and B matrix get a lot simpler. They look like something like this. Um, so your A matrix is gonna be uh, a block zero matrix and an identity matrix, a block zero matrix here. And the only entry which has some values to it is going to be this enter here, which is proportional to, you know, partial G, partial Q, your mass matrix, and all that stuff. And in similar sense, you can you can calculate your building matrix. And the reason why it's much simpler like this is that all the term, the terms that depend on a partial derivative of mass disappear because in the fixed point, this term has to be equal to zero, which pretty much means that Q dot is going to be equal to zero. Um, and then your input is just going to be balancing out gravity. So this is going to cut, cancel out with this. So what happens is that all the partial m, partial, partial m inverse, partial dq, they all disappear. So good exercise to try to check that by yourself. But you can also, you know, just do the partial for everything. And then going to see that some of the terms drop out and some of the terms do, do not drop out. Okay. So let's do, let's do an example. So let's say we have our manipulator, which is depicted here on the right. And what we want to do is that we want to think that is an acrobat. So what that means is that I have I have an actuator that I can apply a torque here in the joint and then the elbow joint, but I don't have an actuator that can apply a torque in the elbow. So the torque, sorry, in the shoulder. So the torque in the shoulder is always zero. The torque in the elbow is going to be tau two, and that's going to be equal to my control input. So what I want to do, I want to linearize around a point of, that I care. And in this case, it's going to be the balancing point. So that's going to be this case right here. So if the manipulator is completely upright, and that's something that we saw in the video in the past, um, then what we can do is that you can use the torque Q to balance this, this system to be upside down like this. So, and that point is going to be equal to x star is equal to pi over 2, 0, 0, and my u0 is going to be 0 as well. So what's going to happen here is that your A and B matrices, they look like this term is here. And they should be constant matrix, right? Because we're just linearized around the term. And just an example, I calculated that if you, if you use these parameters here, so gravity is equal to 10 and all the L's and M's are all equal to 1, the eigenvalues of your A matrix, sorry, this should be a lin, a lin matrix is going to be this guys. And you can see right away that you have two positive eigenvalues and two negative ones. The positive eigenvalues are going to tell you that this is an unstable system. So this is an unstable fixed point, which makes sense, right? Because if you have this pendulum try to stay upright, at any touch that you that you do on the on the mass here on the top. If you don't have any torque in the elbow to counter that, the, the panel is just going to fall, right? So this system is going to be unstable. The stable poles, which are the negative ones, um, they just are. They just tell you that there is a combination of a position and a velocity that there's a, a certain combination of the position and velocity that the panel just have exactly the amount of velocity to go up and stop when it's upright, right? So this is not super important to know, but what I'm, the only thing I'm telling you is that you, when you linearize a system around some, some position, you can figure out if that position, which in this case is a fixed point, is a stable or an unstable fixed point, okay? So when the robot is you know, trying to balance upside down, this is gonna be an unstable fixed point but you, you can imagine that if the, the the both of the joints are just down, then the robot can stay that indefinitely. 
So this is the case, for example, when you have something like this. So now the manipulator is just uh, is just um, um, down, right? So and gravity is on this direction. So what happens here, and you know, this is the x star that you have minus pi over two zero zero and u equals zero. In this situation now, um, gravity makes the pendulum stable, right? So that means that if I grab this pendulum and I put right here on the on the the gravity makes the manipulator stable if i get the manipulator and put it a little bit to the right and i let it go the manipulator is going to swing and then if it has damping it's going to stop right so it's always stable so if i calculate again what is your what is your a linear matrix and i calculate the eigenvalues now i have these eigenvalues and you can see that they all have imaginary terms and the imaginary term means that they're just going to be uh, oscillatory. So if I, and that means that there's no damping in here on the system. So the pen, the manipulator is going to be swinging side by side and, and to all eternity, right? It doesn't dissipate any sort of energy. But what that also means is that this is a stable fixed point because there's no positive real uh, component on these eigenvalues. So what is nice about it is that when you linearize around some point that you care, you can look at the A matrix and the A matrix is gonna tell you if that point is uh, a stable point or if that point is an unstable point. So can the manipulator stay there without applying any sort of effort or is it going to you know, move away as soon as it's, it's perturbed, okay? So what is really interesting about this system, the, the planar manipulator, which in this case is the Acrobat because it doesn't have a, a motor on the shoulder, is that it have, actually has infinite fixed points. So, for example, if you have the your manipulator in a situation that is something like this, so you are in exactly the right position such that your central mass is perfectly aligned with this joint, so that means that this joint is not necessary is not required to apply any torque to maintain that position so that point should be a stable fixed point as well right so the only thing that we require is that uh, there is a point that we require uh q1 double dot to be equal to zero right and q1 dot to be equal to zero so what that's going to mean is that we just need to figure out where is the gravitational torque that goes to that produces uh, that it requires zero torque, and in in all the all the all combinations of theta one and theta two that satisfy this equation are going to be fixed points, right? So, and what is nice about it? So, for example, the manipulator can be on this position it's going to be a fixed point. It can also you know move a little bit down, or it can move a little bit up, as long as central mass always moves here parallel to the base, right? So in, in any of these positions, the manipulator can be there without requiring any torque and the first joint, and that's gonna be a fixed point. So you can linearize around that point and you can write a controller that stabilizes a robot to be around that point. So the only thing that now we, we care, so in the previous cases, when you have the manipulator upright, here, the torque required in the elbow is zero, right? If you have a manipulator upside down, the torque required in the elbow to stay there was zero. But now you have the manipulator at a certain angle like this, right? Such that your central mass right here. And now you do require some torque to fight gravity here. So your U star in this situation is going to be different from zero, right? And then your U star is actually going to be equal to the second entry of your g vector of your gravity vector right so this is going to be your u star <coughs> excuse me um okay so th this is all i, I want to talk about so what is so the thing is when you have this really complicated systems sometimes there's a few points of uh, control points that we care about Control is for, for example, in this case, the Acrobat, we care maybe about balancing the the, the pendulum, the, the manipulator to be upright, or maybe you, wanna, you care about some sort of different configuration as you see here on this slide. 
So what happens is that there's a lot of really interesting and useful control techniques that we can implement in order to make this happen, and that's something that we're going to talk about in, in the next class. Okay, so um, when you look at the the acrobat here, that's exactly the the idea that we that we, that I want to that I want to try to represent with the the system that I just displayed. There's no torque that you can apply with your hands in this case, right? Which is equivalent to the the first link of the planar manipulator. But there's some torque that you can apply, for example, with your hips, which is in this case, in, in the manipulator case, is going to be the second joint, right? So if you have a manipulator, you can apply a, you cannot apply a torque here, but you can apply a, a torque here, and this is going to be equivalent to your your acrobat. Right, so this is pretty much the idea. Okay, that's all I want to talk about today, and um, I release some. I release the guidelines for Mouse on Four later today with a video. All right, thanks guys. Take care.